and minimalists. Hello, simpletons. <laughs> <laughs> Don't badger. You, about me? you can't badger our audience, Josh. Well, I think I was, I was going to reclaim the word. I, well, I guess you can't reclaim it. It's always been a pejorative. Simpletons. Yeah. But like Rihanna has the Navy and Beyonce has the, the beehive. I figured we could have the simpletons, right? Anyone right. who listens to this is a, is a simpleton. Is a simpleton. All right. All right. We'll see if it sticks. <laughs> I've heard you say that behind people's backs before, so yeah, that's fine. <laughs> now we're saying it to their faces. Yeah. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the minimalists. Indeed we are. Today we're going to talk about desire, we're going to talk about yearning, we're going to talk about craving, and impulse, and lust, and longing, and aspiration with today's guest. Our returning champion, yes. Peter Rollins, is in the building. Hello. Thanks so much for being here, man. Oh, it's great to be back. I feel like uh, we're all dressed in black. I feel like yeah. we're the vampires, not the minimalists here. It's kind of, but you got the memo, man. It's very slimming. Yes. that's why I do it. Yeah, me too. I don't. I was explaining this uh, to my mother-in-law in Montana. I was just out there. I was just telling her I wear black because I don't know what else to wear. Yeah, yeah. Um, black is an yeah. easy thing. I'm colorblind as well, to be honest. If I oh. wear colors, it's going to go way wrong. So black and gray, and then I'm fine. Yeah, a little yeah. bit of white. Oh, I should add some gray in. No, no, no I don't want to risk yeah, that's it. Too, yeah, that's too crazy. Too <laughs> that's too crazy. This shirt is soaked right now. You just can't tell because it's black. So, Pete, uh, our last episode we did with you, episode 155 about love. People absolutely loved yeah, that episode. So today we're going to talk about desire. And, and since you're the vice president of desire, oh, yes. we thought... Who's uh, the president of desire? Yeah, that's what I want to do. I'd be demoted. <laughs> well, we've got some questions here today. Before we dive into the questions... The reason I wanted to have you on to talk about this is our mutual friend, Rob Bell. Oh, yeah. uh, you were talking about this concept of Object A on his mm -hmm. podcast. And as opposed to rehashing that entire conversation, I was hoping maybe you could give us a, a quick synopsis because I've tried to rehash it a few times on uh, maximal episodes of our podcast. And uh, I know you'll do a much better job than yeah, me. Yeah, it it's a tough concept to get. So we could spend five podcast just talking about object A, so we will try not to do that. Um, but by the way, this is almost a part two to love. So if, if anybody, because love is all about desire. And yeah, we, so we, yeah. when we talked about love, we're talking about desire. So this is kind of like a part two. Yeah. So go back, listen to that one as well. Um, object A, okay, how do we start? We're starting by talking about something that doesn't exist, right? And that is already a bit of a head spinner. How do you talk about something that doesn't exist? Because mm -hmm. if something doesn't exist, why would you talk about it, right? So can we talk about that for a second or two? Oh, sure. what, yeah, what does it mean? And by the way, that's what in philosophy, that's what the spiritual is in a way. So right, people use the word spiritual in various heebie-jeebie ways. Mm -hmm. but, but in philosophy, you could say that the spiritual is the name for something that is non-reducible to material reality, mm. right? So it's yeah. not, so forget about kind of like uh, angels and fairies or anything like that, whether they exist or not. The spiritual is simply the name for what is not material. Mm. And people tend to go one of two directions with that word, right? They either try to get rid of it entirely, crude materialism, or they try to anthropomorphize it make it into like a, a kind bearded of, figure. Exactly, yeah. right? So those are two extremes. What do, you tr what do you do if you try not to get into either of those extremes? So first of all, what, so here's, a, here's an example of talking about nothing. Zero. Uh -huh. Zero, like what is zero? The Greeks mm. didn't even have a word for it yeah, for a long time. Absolutely, mm. and you Americans don't even have it in your lifts, right? You go to Europe, oh, what's, yeah. what's the first floor? Zero, yeah. Zero, yeah. because zero is a number. <laughs> zero is one, you can right. count it. I can go, z there's one zero, that's one. <laughs> or it's G, which for the longest time I thought meant garage. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do even now in America, I will often press the wrong floor because I'm oh, well, actually in Europe, I'll press first floor mm -hmm. because I've been living here for so long. And then mm -hmm. I get out at the wrong floor. I'm not getting out the ground floor. So zero, you guys, you Americans don't have it. You start with one. And that makes sense. You start with one. Mm. But no, you start with zero because zero is a number. So as soon as as soon as we were able to to basically put a, a, a mark around nothingness, it was a real advance within mathematics, mm. right? So we're talking about nothing. In the same way, when we talk about, let me see, the unconscious, mm. we're not talking about something, we're talking about what destabilizes us. We're not really talking about something, we're talking about this, this deadlock, this conflict within us. Mm. So object A, what's that? This is a fictional object 
that we start to fantasize about because we can't get it, right? Mm. So um, I don't know if we talked about this in the last episode, but there's the, the pleasure principle is this idea that I want stuff, right? When you're a kid, you want to climb all the trees you can climb. You want to eat all the chocolate you can eat. You want to win all the games that you can play. That's the pleasure principle. And then reality principle is what gets in the way, right? You can't eat all the chocolate you want because your parents will stop you. You can't climb all the trees you want because your body won't let you. You can't win all the games that you want because your friends want to win, right? Mm. So that's reality. And we start to um, we start to fantasize about what we could get if we could get rid of reality and just have what we wanted. Mm. And that fantasy, we start to imagine something wonderful that if only we got it, it would be wonderful. And that's object A. That's object A. So and, and that tends to change over time. And, yeah. and it can even change throughout the hour, right? It, mm -hmm. And especially changes once we, we get it. Yes. Oh, absolutely. There's a beautiful analogy that philosopher Shizak uses where he says, so when Darwin was writing, supposedly he had this uh, kind of young earth creationist Christian friend. Who, and uh, Darwin was like, listen, how are you going to reconcile my insights into evolution with six-day creationism? You think the earth was created 6,000 years ago? And his friend said, well, God made the earth look old, right? <laughs> so the fossils are like just were put there, right? Makes sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just like in a movie, you've got yeah. old cars. They're not old cars. They're brand new cars, right? Mm -hmm. So fossils are these just things that God put there. That, the patina that God added. Yes. And he was building the earth. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And Shizek says, this is actually very intelligent. It's actually very clever. That's what object A is, right? Every time you get it, all you've got is the fossil. But it's a fossil of something that never existed, hmm. right? So you always feel like, you, oh, I got it. And I, oh, I didn't quite get it. And you're left with the fossilized remains. And you still have the fantasy that that fossilized remains kind of connects with something. Now let's talk but it about doesn't. what that might be in our culture right now. I mean, some of the, the most manifest examples of this are, you know, I want the, the, the new house, mm -hmm. the new car, the job promotion, the pay raise, the new shirt or pair of jeans. What are some other things that are sort of object A, the, the thing that we yearn for? And then, of course, we get it, and maybe it temporarily seems to fill this void, even though it doesn't, because we get a, a bit of a dopamine rush, Yeah, right? Gives yeah. us a bit of hit, a yeah. bit of a hit. Yeah. yeah, a little bit, but then it leaves us feeling empty the same way a hit of, of a drug would do, because you get that same sort of dopamine rush from that. And then, in a weird way, you are actually, you feel more empty than ever, because now you no longer have that object A to pursue, and then so what happens? You start to seek out whatever the next object A is because all you're left with is that fossil of this thing that never really existed. You know, you, you explained yeah. this this concept of object A to me probably like a year ago, maybe. And uh, we were having a drink and, and, and you explained it to me. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, this is the Tesla for me. Like for me, I because I live in LA and I'm like, oh, if I get a Tesla, I'm going to enjoy LA more and it's going to make it so much more enjoyable and I'm going to like the car. But what I appreciate is that I understand what my object A is. Yeah. And I've actually realized that the desire to have the Tesla, I enjoy more than if I actually got the Tesla. Yes, yes exactly. It's really weird. Like, I love the thought of getting it, but it's like I've had dreams about getting a Tesla and it's such a letdown. I'm like, oh, why did I drop all that money on a Tesla? You see, it even gives you dreams. That's right. It gives you dreams mm. that they're wonderful. It allows you to look online and look at all of the stats and how mm. fast it can go and all of the tech. You can go into the, the, the place and you can test drive it. I mean, let's be honest, that's where all the fun is. And then, mm. of course, the day you get it, it could be, it's fun, but... It's not, it, it isn't what it kind of promises. The promise is always a bit of a letdown. Something is going to replace it. Yeah. So if I had to give like the elevator pitch for Object A, I would say Object A is that thing that we are constantly looking at, whether it's a relationship or whether it's a physical item or whether it's like a fantasy, you know, status, whatever it is. There's something that we're looking at in the distance and we're like, man, if we could just somehow get there, yeah. we're going to be complete. We're going to be happy. Yes. But... The whole concept behind object A is that once you get to that object, it just it becomes a different object A yes, in your life. It dissipates, it becomes something else. Mm -hmm. And something we'll get to, maybe not right now, but is that this isn't a bad thing. 
No. It's a, but it's just something to start recognizing that this is a part of how we desire. Because actually what's even worse is when you have no object day, when mm. when you have no desire at all. I mean, depression in a sense is not, you know, you know, if you lose something that you desire, a person, someone you breaks up with you and you lose the person you desire, you don't just lose the person you desire, you lose what allows you to desire anything at all. So they're what's called the object cause of desire. So your loved one is the object of your desire and they're the object cause of your desire. Mm. So what that means is when you lose the object of your desire, you lose the ability to desire anything. So you no longer care about your work. You no longer care about going out to restaurants. You no longer care about Christmas. You no longer, you know, all the things that you used to enjoy mm -hmm. alongside this person all suddenly disappear. Wow. So in one way, depression is, how to get over depression is how to get your desire started again mm -hmm. because your desire just stops and you just don't even want to get out of bed. Yeah. You know, it's very, very, very difficult. That's interesting. This whole object day thing is, uh, I think it's a great lead into Nate's question here. Let's dive in. Nate from Salt Lake City has a question. Hi, my name's Nate. Uh, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. I wanted to ask you what your uh, advice is for making a big life change, um, making a big move. Uh, my girlfriend and I have been talking about moving out of the state. Or we've lived in Utah our entire lives. We've talked about moving out of the state and moving somewhere else to start a new adventure and try something different. We love Utah. We want to try something different. And we've talked about it, we've talked about it, and talked about it, and we've never done anything about it. Um, we're tired of talking about it, and we want to do something about it. Um, and I guess what would be your advice to taking that first step and actually making a big move? All right. So, Pete, it seems to me that, well, previously, Nate's object day was getting a promotion at work. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Ryan and I both worked in the corporate world. We both worked for telecom, and <laughs> that was an object day for me. Uh, it was one of my many object days. I was, yeah. I was juggling a yeah. lot of empty fossils. I, th I feel like Nate is so much smarter than us because uh, I, I could get the promotion. I'm like, oh, I haven't climbed high enough. Right. And, and, <laughs> and as soon as I got it, it was like, well, yeah. na now what's the next one, right? right yeah. And there's a weird part of me that feels that maybe greatness requires misery to some extent because I, I, I look at Michael Jordan, who is probably the greatest basketball player of all time. Uh, I would argue against that, but a lot of people say that, that he is. But he seemed utterly miserable because he it, it almost required that to a certain extent. And now what I would say about Nate is he's gotten rid of that object day for maybe a more healthy object day. He, he and his, his wife are looking to, or girlfriend are looking to, move somewhere else and so now it's a a, a new destination new geography is object a uh, yeah. let's talk about where we get the this concept of ob object a from oh that's good yes let's talk about that because i noticed something nate said just as the at the beginning he said that his partner had given uh, your documentary to him showed your documentary to mm -hmm. him and he really enjoyed it this actually is a key to understanding how where we get object a from mm. is the weird thing is we think our desires are our own they're not. They're given to us by other people. And this is called mimetic desire. There's right. a guy called René Girard uh, who really does great work in this. But that what happens is when you're going out with somebody, because obviously your documentary is terrible, and so <laughs> nobody would actually like it directly, right? <laughs> but, I couldn't agree more, Pete. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but if someone else likes it and I like them, I start to like it because they like it, yeah. right? This is mimetic desire. Mimetic desire is this weird thing where you start, say, going out with somebody and you start to like what they like. Yeah. You start to find yourself being into French cinema and long walks along the beach or whatever they're into. Right. And then weirdly, you start to think that they're your desires mm. and they, they're into certain bands and then you start to be into those bands. Mm. And then if you break up, you start to fight over who owns the CDs. <laughs> I mean, that's an old <laughs> reference that I so was your Spotify. But um, the, interestingly, what I desire is the desire of ones I desire. So that's the most precious material in the world, right? It's not gold, it's not health. The, the most precious material in the world is the desire of the desire, no, the desire of the people I desire. You could tweet that podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, cause I desire the desire of those I desire. Mm -hmm. I want their desire. But also the second bit to that is I desire what they desire. Because I, I, if I see that what they desire, sometimes I want to kind of take the place of that. I want, I want the attention that they're giving the other thing. You imagine when you're a kid and you see your parents giving desire to something else and you kind of want to kind of get that desire. Mm -hmm. So 
it's it's interesting. It's important to learn that because what Rene Girard says, he says the problem is this, right? Say, right, you're going out with somebody, mm -hmm. just to use the example of sexual desire, mm -hmm. and I think you're cool. Uh, which is a hard thing for your listeners to imagine, but I think you're cool. <laughs> and, um, Thanks, <laughs> yeah. My mom says the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then here's the crazy thing, right? I maybe start to desire who you desire. You mm -hmm. say, I really fancy this person. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, oh, and then I go like, I really kind of fancy them as well. Then what happens is we get into conflict mm. because although I've kind of taken the desire on because of you, I feel it's my own. Now we're in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm and it causes lots of problems. And uh, and then we get into what's called scapegoating and we have to blame somebody else in order to kind of reconcile. Mm -hmm. So where does our desire come from? Here's the funny thing is your desire, you feel it's yours, whatever you desire, but actually it might be the desire of your mother, your father, your siblings, your friends. You're taking on all of these other people's desires. And here's then even more complicated. Sometimes you don't desire your desire. Sometimes you end up in a job that you kind of hate, but you kind of choose. Mm -hmm. And so you, you obviously choose it freely because that's what you wanted to do, but you also hate it. And then you discover that, oh my goodness, I'm fulfilling the desire of my parents or I'm desire, I, you know, this is the weird thing about being human is we can not desire what we desire. And it gets yeah. very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our, our book, Everything That Remains, the um, one of the first lines on here is, what if everything you... What if everything you ever wanted isn't actually what you want? Mm. And, oh, and, yeah. and I think that, that that's what really happened to me and Ryan. Like we grew up really poor and he said, well, uh, the key to happiness obviously is for us to go out, get the corporate job, work eight hours a week, climb the corporate ladder, make really good money, buy all the things we have been deprived of the first 18 years of our lives. And we did that, got everything we ever wanted, but of course everything we ever wanted wasn't actually what we wanted. They were mimetic desires. Yes. They, they were they were the, the desires of, of a heavily mediated culture that does a very good job of of manufacturing desires through advertisements and then sort of propagating them through the the proletariat and and so by age 30 ryan and i were sort of like scratching our heads like hey what happened yeah. <laughs> like, wh wh and, and i think nate uh, that's kind of where where he is right now now he asks about moving i'm not going to go into a, a lot about that right now because we did an entire podcast episode called moving and really about how to find the right place and, and how to test out a place for a short period of time. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. If we can go back to, to, to that episode, you can, you can listen to that, Nate. And I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. Uh, it's really the story of me and Ryan going from those suit and tie corporate guys at the wireless company, at a telecommunications company, to becoming minimalists and not getting rid of our desires, but yeah. getting more appropriate desires yeah. in a way. And also, yeah, and kind of owning your desire. This is, the f this, this is what Nietzsche talks about when he says, embrace your fate. What he kind of means is, it, it sounds strange at first, but when you come into the world, you say as, a, as an adolescent, you start to question, you start to think, you start to kind of wonder, what do I want in the world? You're already full of desires and beliefs because from, from years of being brought up in a certain way. Mm. And so it's not that you start with an empty shopping cart and you go into this shopping mall of ideas and you take stuff off the shelves and put it into your shopping cart, your right. mind, right? Your mind, the shopping cart is already full of stuff, right? right? And you have to pull stuff out of it. So sometimes the first thing is to do is to go, how do I kind of, how do I enjoy my enjoyment? How do I embrace my desire? How do I make something my own? So mm -hmm. it, it, yes, of course it started somewhere else. It started because of, in various ways, but how do I make my desire my own mm. and, and, not, and not be tossed around by like it like a ship without an anchor yeah mm -hmm. so yeah all right we got another question here from Chantel in huntington beach california hi guys i got a text from my husband today that said what moment from the last seven days are you most likely to remember 10 years from now and i honestly could not answer that question and so i'm my question for you is what would you suggest we do with our lives to answer that question and say something with conviction? I work full-time. I go to school full-time. My husband works full-time commuting 
90 minutes per day. And I just feel like we're in a rut right now where we don't have a lot of time for something that would let us answer that question and feel good about it. Yeah, it's interesting, man. I think there's like this Western uh, idea that we have to like constantly be living our best life. And we have to be asking these deep questions like, what have we done in the last seven days? And it it makes us feel like we have to have this like grandiose action that we must take. And in and, and, uh, Chantel's case, it's on a weekly basis. Mm-hmm. And I guess like what I want to tell Chantel is like, don't put so much pressure on yourself to do these grandiose things. I mean, it could be something real simple that you remember for the next 10 years. But it, I think as soon as you put a number on it, like if she was to tell herself, all right, I got to do something every seven weeks that I'm going to remember for the next 10 years. Uh, I don't know if that's possible, you know? Well, maybe rephrase the question a little bit because I, you and I tend to disagree on the subject. I think it's just because we use the wrong words here. I think she should be living her best life. But, oh, sure. Um, the best doesn't mean perfect, right? Like the right. best team in the NBA does not have a perfect record. The best uh, uh, baseball player doesn't have a perfect sort of hitting percentage. Mm-hmm. They just have the, the, the best. Um, and and so maybe if I were to rephrase the question, because I do agree with you here, Ryan, that w- we're, maybe we're confusing excitement for yes for um that's what i mean when i say best like i have to i have to constantly be growing and i have to constantly be excited right and and so maybe if i were to rephrase that this and i'd really be interested to hear what what pete has to say about this because he might not necessarily agree instead of saying what moment from the last seven days will you remember 10 years from now which is a powerful question i think uh maybe it's is what i'm doing today or is what i'm doing right now or is what i'm doing this week will it matter a year from now and and quite often Mm -hmm. i think we get so caught up in these sort of ephemeral pacifiers the the twitter arguments or whatever that we if we step back we realize no this isn't going to matter a year from now or 10 years from now it's not going to matter two weeks from now right and and so i think Pete, maybe what what chantelle is is talking about here is is modifying her desires to do something that matters. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. This is all very interesting. Hi, Chantel, by the way, can I say that? Yeah. Hello, if you're <laughs> listening, how is it going? I, I've got to say, first of all, that you're setting the bar very high because I can't remember what I did 10 minutes ago. Yeah. So I like it, I, 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 but I, that's just a, a bad thing on my part. I can't remember anything. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Here, here's an. I don't know if this will go anywhere, but I want to give you an interesting saying by Cicero, and I'm not a Stoic as such, but uh, Cicero was a Stoic, and he said only, only the wise are rich, mm. right? And it's it's an interesting phrase because at first you go, only the wise are rich. So if you're loaded, you're wise. That doesn't make <laughs> sense, right? There's lots of dumb people who are loaded, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's very specific. It's not only the rich are wise. Yeah. It's only the wise are rich. Exactly. Yeah. Only the wise are rich. Yes, yeah. exactly. So already you can start to pick it apart. And one of the things he means is if you're poor, if you feel always that you're lacking something, that you need to, to get something in order to, 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 to feel wealthy, right? Mm-hmm. So weirdly, you could have so much stuff, you could have everything, but mm-hmm. still feel you don't have enough. Yeah. So you still feel poor. Whereas... You could, you can get to a place where, as long as your basic needs are met, um, you don't feel that you're, you have to do something in order for your life to be rich. And so he says, only the wise are rich, because he says a certain, there's a certain wisdom in embracing the lack and not not having to have something that will fix it. So you know, it can be oppressive if you're looking for that one thing that you'll remember for ten years. Yeah, that can actually like. Uh, you know, that that could create a lot of anxiety, to be yeah. honest. I think it create a, a very strong sense of lack and a real sense of we have to do something mm-hmm. that could um, can lead to a sense of poverty. Yeah. So how do you, And because here's the trick between the two of you. Is I, I heard you're saying you sometimes disagree and it's live your best life and maybe you're like more of the get rid of the idea of living <laughs> your best life. Yeah. 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 And I, th- you know, it, that, that could be yeah, two sides of the same coin that, mm-hmm. It really is, yeah. Yeah, and and you know, and and we want to parse these things. I not that I, you know, there's real differences, but mm-hmm. there's a certain sense in which wanting to, for example, achieve things, have a life that is meaningful, 
um, and yet not a life in which you're always pursuing something that just makes you always feel like you haven't got there. Right. Yeah. So yeah. how do how do you do that? I mean, I'm not. Answering, I'm just asking yeah. questions here. No, that's a good question. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I thought of like two things that uh, I do in my life that I'm going to remember ten years from now. Yeah. Um. One is one is like a very specific example. I went uh, snowboarding a week ago on January 11th. It was a, a year to the day of when I broke my back in Montana, and I have been taking care of myself for like the last year getting massages, chiropractor, you know, uh, exercise, diet. And when I went to face that mountain, like there was like a, a, a lot of anxiety, but a, I was grateful that like I had been taking care of myself. Uh, I was grateful that I had, you know, got the care that I needed. And then B, like, I was grateful that I was able to face that fear. I went down the same exact run yeah. this through the same exact tree line. I like waved to the tree that broke my back on the way down. <laughs> and it felt, it felt so good to go down there. You, you, you hit on something actually that I was just thinking about. This is good because there's a negative side to this because what is it? What are the things that we remember for 10 years? Mm. Almost always pain. Yeah, the trauma. Mm, so, yeah. And this mm. is called repetition compulsion. So trauma is basically the the idea that the past is never past. History is, ne is, is always present. So a repetition compulsion is basically that your past remains present. Mm. Always, so you keep repeating, keep going out with the same type of person. Keep so trauma is in a sense what you never forget, mm. or you try to forget, but it, you remember it in your body. Your mm. body remembers in your actions. Mm. So, so another angle on this that you're taking yeah. is that actually the trick is how can we live a life where there's nothing we remember <laughs> ten years from now. That yeah, actually might like be the that. good life. The good life well, is the one. Yeah. Where <laughs> I was, uh, yeah. Our friend Chris, uh, Chris Ryan, uh, who wrote Civilized to Death, one of my favorite books, and he he was talking about this on his podcast recently. He, he there was apparently this awful serial rapist. Uh, it was a man who would hang out outside of bars and then lure other really 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 drunk men back to his house. And then I guess roofie them or give them some sort of drug that made them pass out. And then he would rape them and videotape it. And eventually he got caught, you know, long story short here. And then they, they found like all these hard drives, the equivalent of like uh, 300 DVDs worth of his footage of these scenes. And I think it was 190 people that he, he did this to, but almost none of them knew that this happened to them and so the police had a very fascinating sort of moral dilemma because if you don't know this happened to you and you, you know as long as there were no consequences if you didn't get some sort of fatal std or something like that yeah. uh, then do you tell that person because were they traumatized when the event occurred or were they traumatized when hmm. the police told them about it. Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that. And I don't think any of us actually know the answer to it. Part of me is like, yes, of course I'd want you to tell me that. But then maybe even a more rational part of me is like, why would I want that trauma thrust upon me? Yeah. But then, it's, and then the, the next level, because this, this is a good philosophy question. This is the kind of thing you do in first year philosophy. Because then the next question is, but then if we know that the police don't tell us, then we're going to be anxious. Did that happen to me? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I remember I went home one night drunk with the, yeah. yeah. So then, then you get to the level of if the police don't tell you, do you have to have a society where you don't know that the police don't tell you? Mm. And the, yeah, so it's a really, it really <laughs> gets circles. In, yeah. into very interesting circles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I just want to encourage Chantel. Like, just, you don't have to like go on a trip every week. You don't have to like do something grandiose. Like for me, you know, getting back to the, like my back, um, I appreciate the little decisions I've made on a weekly basis. And like, I look back and I remember these decisions I've made to keep good health and like to take care of myself. Like that is something that you're, you're going to remember 10 years from now. It doesn't have to be this like, Oh yeah. Remember we, we climbed the top of Mount Everest and we were living our best life. And we took that selfie. Yeah. We posted it on Instagram and everyone was like, yeah, Chantel, you're living your best life. <laughs> there, there is, yeah. There is a sense of like, every time I take a picture and I do this, when I take pictures and whatever, I'm yeah. trying to capture a moment to remember it. But sometimes, not always, but often, a healthy life is a life in which we're able to enjoy what's going on, mm -hmm. but not try to capture. So, because mm -hmm. here's a trick in, in psychoanalysis, one of the main reasons why people come to analysis is because they live in the eternal, right? That t time has stopped. Now, time hasn't stopped physically, they're still getting old, but something has happened in their life that doesn't get old. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, if I say two plus two equals four, it doesn't get old. Even if I get old, two plus two equals four 
just remains as young as ever, right? <laughs> um, in the same way, somebody might break up with a person and the pain 10 years later it's just it's just as young mm. and it, it's basically so they're caught in the eternal mm. they're caught in and that's that's kind of the the repetition thing they're caught in time has stopped in some dimension in their being time has stopped and the the task is to get time moving again and sometimes the ability to just kind of like enjoy the ride and not yeah. try to capture a moment yeah. no matter how amazing it is you climb mount everest Fantastic, but tomorrow you're going to make a really good sandwich, right. and, um, right. and you know, and kind of like enjoy a, that sandwich, enjoy that sandwich just as much as you enjoyed Everest. Yeah, <laughs> and sometimes trying to capture the moment actually ruins the moment. Yeah, yeah. Eternal eternity is not always good, and mm -hmm. and I say whenever someone has a trauma, they know that because a yeah. trauma is something that steps out of time. When you have a trauma, it weirdly jumps out of temporality and it just stays as young and nasty as ever. Mm -hmm. So eternity is not always good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, anytime Chantel can experience a little growth in her life, like that's that's what she's going to remember 10 years from now. Uh, yeah, whether it's health-wise or whether it's overcoming a fear, because that's what I'm going to remember the most 10 years from now. It's not the back pain. It's going to be like facing that anxiety and that fear like that. It felt really good. Like it, yeah, that's what when I when I heard your story, I was thinking like, what in a, in a way, the trauma was there, but when you conquered it, mm. t time started again. Amen. You know, in a way, yeah. that's 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 when time started. It absolutely, for you I can't even tell you how nervous I was like when I first like booted up. Yeah, it was like it was. I've I've never been that anxious putting on a snowboard. Yeah, and it was and it was just muscle memory. Yeah. yeah, from the trauma. It was crazy. Chantel, I'm going to send you a couple tickets to our West Coast tour. We're going on tour again. We've got eight cities along the West Coast of the United States and Canada. We're going to be going to some other cities as well. So if you're interested, just head on over to theminimalists.com slash tour. You can find the city that is closest to you or sign up for our email list. We'll let you know when we're coming to your city. We're going to give a talk and do a live version of the Minimalist podcast in those cities. All right, Ryan, what time is it? It is time for our lightning round where we answer questions from people's text messages. I've really been enjoying this community thing, man. It's been been fun connecting with people on a on a on a personal basis. I mean, Josh so, sends a lot of dick pics, but um, <laughs> other than that, I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> it it's always Dick Cheney or, or Dick Nixon, right? Uh, <laughs> Pete, so what we've been doing is Ryan and I, we have this uh, phone number. By the way, if you're listening to this at home, 937-202-4654. People can text us directly. And I it, saw this. Is that true? Yeah, yeah it goes it right to both of our phones. If yeah. I text this, right it now. goes to your phone. Yes. Yeah, dude, we'll show it to you I don't believe this. it. I'm going to test it and see. All right, right? I really does. If it's not true, I'm going to tweet about it. Okay. And expose <laughs> yeah. okay. Wait, dude, let me tell you. I, so I went over to Peter's house, like, I don't know, a couple months ago. It was right after we did the apartment tour. Uh -huh. And he was like, dude, I got to give you I gotta give you a little shit. <laughs> for your apartment <laughs> tour <laughs> i was like what he was like i've been to your apartment man he's like you own way more than what you had showed on that video and i'm like <laughs> all, all I saw was a picture i saw this picture yeah. and he was I'm, sitting in this like space meditating like, in the room. i'm I like you didn't watch I the video did you he was like no i didn't <laughs> Because he instantly was like, oh, Ryan's totally like fooling all his audience members. Yeah, <laughs> that was, that was very funny because I, all I saw was the picture. And I was like, I'm going to give him so shit. So this is just my way of saying he will call us out. Yeah. I will call you. <laughs> you can check out Ryan's home tour. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, you can text us your questions. We don't respond to everyone's. We, I've responded to over a thousand text messages now. Oh, my goodness. And um, I've had a lot of fun. I've learned that people ask some questions via text they wouldn't usually ask via social media. But uh, you can follow us on social media yeah. if you like. It's at The Minimalists, wherever uh, you, you wh well, whatever social media platforms yeah. you're on. But, uh, and you're at Peter Rollins on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, but we got some questions here, Ryan. Let's dive into those. We do. All right. April wrote in, can you talk about lust and yearning for others when in a marriage? Interesting. So here's what we're trying to do. Pete, we, we try to do uh, we try to answer these questions with short, shareable, less than 140 character. <laughs> uh, Good luck, responses. Pete. <laughs> we, we call them minimal maxims. Uh, we people can uh, copy and share uh, share them from our show notes. Uh, share them on so social media if you'd like, and you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place. You, minimal maxims. You just com. ramble on, and podcast Sean will make it nice and pretty okay. on post. Yeah. Here's, here, here, here's my here's my pithy answer, and then right. we can we can yeah. unpack it a little bit. Get in everything you want metastasizes into not having what you. You need. Mm. 
I think sometimes we we get everything that we want or that we think we want. I do it with cake all the time. But <laughs> but when we do that, yeah, I said cake is is a really good example. We get these sort of empty calories of consumerism or whatever. And we end up forsaking what we actually need, the the nutrition, so to yeah. speak, right? Mm -hmm. You can live off of cake for a while because it has all the macronutrients <laughs> you need. It does not have the, the micronutrients. Though. So What's the uh, saying? Man cannot live on cake alone? Yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, that's an ancient one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that, Nietzsche? <laughs> <laughs> Had to be. <laughs> so, so uh, Pete, what do you think? Uh, um, the the uh, can you talk about lust and yearning for others when in a marriage? That's that's object A again. Yeah, in in 140 characters less. Here it is. One's lust is not the problem; it's the solution to a problem. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Damn, I'm not even going to read my answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? Uh, here's my pithy answer. It's just, it's real simple. Honest communication creates lasting relationships. And what I mean by that is, you know what? If you want to talk about lust and you want to talk about other people that you are attracted to, talk about them with your partner. Yeah, yeah. Bex I mean, and I like, will often, like, we'll, we'll check out people together. I love it, dude. Mariah and I, like, I mean, we're very open with it. Yeah. I mean, I'm a little bit more open than she is, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It creates, it creates a lot more trust between us and a, a lot stronger bond where she can be like, were you just looking at that girl's butt? I'm like, yeah, I got eyes. I use them. <laughs> and it's, it makes a nice little moment for us. Like, it's not it's not anything that... Uh, that we can't handle as as a mature couple. Because the, the alternative is what? Repression? Yeah, yeah. So that's the issue. If it becomes very secretive, then it becomes even more desirous. And then, and here's the funny thing about this, about lust as a desire, is that, and we don't see this, we don't feel it, but I think we kind of know it's true, is the more, like, you, 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 I'm a romantic, right? A romantic is someone who'll kill a kid just to have sex with a person, right? So I am a hopeless romantic, right? And, you know, they will kill an orphanage full of kids just to have one night with the person How many kids love. have you killed, Pete? <laughs> they will kill a world full of kids, right? Yeah, Let's so. just be clear. Killing the kids to have sex with an adult, right? right. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's very that, important. That doesn't make it much better. To be <laughs> I like the fact that that makes it, in your head, hey, perfectly that's acceptable. My, that's my morals there. <laughs> right. That's, yeah. that's your moral compass. Like, he's killing a lot of kids, but it is an adult he's having sex right, with, right? <laughs> but um so th but that is the kind of the hopeless romantic in a very mm. negative sense is mm. you'll do anything you'll cut off your arm to be with the person mm. um but the idea being that then when you're with them the the letdown is huge right <laughs> that the more that you have to do the more the obstacle the the more the desire and then the more the letdown so lust functions in a very difficult way that so for example somebody's like i just will i'll leave my wife and my kids and i'll leave everything my job i'll give up all my money i'll give up everything to be with you and then the person says yes and then three months uh -oh. later yeah yeah yeah. that's the problem that's the term it's like you should oh. have killed all those kids <laughs> yeah that's it that was a bit of a disaster can i take that back you know that is that's the ultimate letdown mm. so when you're honest about your desires with another person and you can at least take the edge off the 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 lust you know so it's a uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think i think the thing there is we'll we'll, we'll wrap up the segment on on this but uh, with the when you said the lust isn't the problem when you get the the other person or whatever you end up being the problem not your not the the thing that you got because you had a, a different sort of expectation you had an expectation in your mind that once i get this thing i will be complete or I'll be better or I'll have what I want or my all of my desires yes. will be met and what a poor expectation that yes. is because yeah. here's a trick I'm sorry I know it has to be quick it's not very like <laughs> lightning round but the the problem with romantic relationships for most of us is problems of desire like whenever people lust yeah. after somebody else and it's always how do we manage how do we keep our desire alive how do we manage our desire how do we make it productive so whenever someone wants to have an affair or has an affair when there's lust usually when i say it's a solution to a problem it's the problem of desire there's a there's a deadlock in desire in the relationship and this is a frantic attempt to fix that but it's a bad attempt like it doesn't work it causes pain mm -hmm. so always when i see things like like um, affairs and lust, I'm asking, what is that trying to solve? Where is the deadlock of desire in the relationship? And you have to solve that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Before we 
dive into our added value segment and our listener tips today. It looks like we got a, a bunch more surprise questions this week. Can a person's desires ever be truly satisfied or are we cursed to perpetually feed them? Is there a difference between mimetic desire and personal desire? We'll talk about the difference between the two there. How do you reconcile personal desire with guilt and beliefs? The, uh, the desire to not be attached to desires is a desire <laughs> within itself. <laughs> how, do you, how do you detach from the desire to not hold on to any desires? Oh, man. man. <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's a fairly deep philosophical question, and we'll dive into that with Pete. Also, is there a difference between being impulsive and being spontaneous? And are our desires tied to our fears and vice versa? Also, five insane ideas about sex from ancient philosophers and a bunch more questions for our friend peter rollins and if you want to hear all that <laughs> i feel like that question needs to be like a hit, hits blunt meme what have oh, you ever seen the hits oh, blunt meme yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm sorry keep going <laughs> if you want to hear all that you can listen to this week's maximal episode uh, that's right you're currently listening to our weekly minimal episode but each week ryan and i record an entirely different much longer much more personal maximal episode on the minimalist private podcast which is the best way for us to fund this podcast and keep it 100 percent advertisement free when you subscribe to the minimalist private podcast on patreon you'll also receive a personal link so that our maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app find all the details over at the minimalists.com slash support ryan what else you got for us this week it's time it's time to listen to our listener comments and tips and voicemails check them out hello this is bryce from delray beach florida i wanted to share a tip that i came up with to live a more balanced and intentional life what i did was i have a planner that instead of going by the hour it goes by the different realms of health and it made this really cool acronym that's easy to remember and easy to apply. And that's special. Every day is special and every day is an opportunity to grow. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, communally, intellectually, adaptively, and lucratively. Hey guys, this is Tracy from Denver, Colorado. I'm calling to say thank you because in early 2017, I listened to your podcast on finances and budgeting. And you kept talking about Dave Ramsey, and I I started going into that rabbit hole listening to his podcast. And because of that and the knowledge that you guys share, I'm sitting here tonight with this being the last night I ever have debt. I make my final payment tomorrow, and I will be debt-free for the first time in 23 years. I've been busting my butt at this for uh, one year and 363 days. So I am extremely excited to celebrate this milestone tomorrow, and I thank you guys because prior to listening to those podcasts, I was just looking for a way to figure out how to manage my finances better, and it felt so difficult and complicated, and you guys made it so easy and shared information, and it has changed my life. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Peter Rollins for joining us today. You can check out his website. Uh, actually, Follow him on Patreon if you get an opportunity. He does some amazing lectures and he dives deep on philosophy, but in a way that is actually interesting and, and not uh, it's not going to put you in a coma. He he is uh, he's so introspective, but he's he's also um, I don't know as you've seen throughout this episode here. He has a way of tackling questions and diving deeper in a way that keeps you interested. <laughs> yeah, it's like the philosophy behind the philosophy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really so, good. So patreon.com slash Peter Rollins. Uh, you can also follow him on Twitter. He's at Peter Rollins on Twitter and Instagram. Follow him over there. We'll put a link to his website in the show notes as well. And uh, real quick for right here, right now. Oh, and by the way, check out his podcast. The Fundamentalists is the name of his podcast. I really enjoy it. It's him and his roommate. His roommate is a comedian. He's a philosopher and they wax philosophical, but in a very funny way each week over on The Fundamentalists podcast. And uh, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of The Minimalists. We want to encourage you to get clear on your values. It is a new year and you'll hear Ryan and I talking about aligning your short-term actions with your long-term values. Well, you can only do that if you know what your values are. Otherwise, your values are going to be thrust upon you by the society writ large, and that is a recipe for discontent. So get clear on what your values are. Ryan and I believe there are four different types of values, 
and we put together this free values worksheet and I also wrote an essay to go along with it called how to understand your values. You can find that over at theminimalists.com slash V as in values and you can download the free worksheet over there as well. You can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Minimalists. And if you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your email inbox each week, then sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails each week. For our added value this week, I thought this was the perfect song since we're talking about desire. Noah Gunderson, he's uh, one of my favorite songs of his is a song called Bad Desire from his album White Noise. So for out of value this week, let's listen to Bad Desire from Noah Gunderson. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.